Uh, tonight, I want to share in regard to something that, uh, well, it, will you, will you, will you allow a professor to be a little philosophical at the beginning? <laughs> I promise I won't be philosophical very long. <laughs> but, um, education is about truth. Uh, knowledge and wisdom had to do with knowledge and wisdom of the truth. And education used to be based, in fact, there used to be a theocentric uh, uh, educational system, the early colleges, the colonial colleges, the early national colleges, where our founders were educated, uh, assumed that there was one truth, God's truth. And whether it was chemistry or physics or history or whatever discipline you're studying, you were studying one truth. Uh, chemistry is God's truth about that subject, and history is God's truth about that subject, and mathematics is God's truth about that subject. There is one truth. And really, I, I say to my classes all the time, what has taken hold is, is one of the great lies of the enemy today, that truth is relative, that, in other words, what you believe or you believe or you believe uh is true for you, is true for you, is true for you, and you can act on that, and then everyone will be happy. Well, that's a great lie of the enemy, because once you say that truth is relative, in other words, that it's subjective to you and to you and to you and to you, you lose the notion of truth. Now, here, here's, the, here's the biblical truth. There is only eternal truth. There is no other truth than eternal truth. Because truth is something. If something is true, if 2 plus 2 is 4, it's true at the beginning of time, it's true at the end of time, and it's true in eternity. Truth can only be true forever. Else, if something changes you've lost the whole concept of what is true. And the Greeks said, and they were right biblically, what is true is what is good, and what is good is what is true. <coughs> and that's so. That's so biblically. Because the only definition of good and evil in the Bible, what is good is God's will. Well, God's will is true. And what is evil is against God's will. And so that's against truth. That's false. And there is only one truth. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now tonight, the teaching is, the Holy Spirit is truth. We've been looking at the Holy Spirit and attributes of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is power. The Holy Spirit is purity. The Holy Spirit is faith. The Holy Spirit is truth. Now, let's begin to look, and I picked out three examples uh, of great truth. Now, remember what we've said about the Holy Spirit. Everything we say about the Holy Spirit is true about the Father and the Son. But the Father, the Father is truth, and Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. I'll read, a, I'll read a verse about that in a minute. But they are still in heaven. And the Holy Spirit, as truth, brings truth from the Father and from the Son, just like He brings power, just like He brings purity, just like He brings faith. He brings truth down to us to make it real so that as the Holy Spirit brings truth, you know here, not here. Now, let me, I'll say this several times tonight, probably. Your mind, your intellect, do not determine truth. That's what men think. And that's why they get into such great error. And if you look at great error and great falsehood in the world's history, it is some of the most intelligent people, some of the most intellectual people who have come to the greatest lies. 
lies that cause, like, like, uh, like Marx in communism. One of the most influential lies is Marxism. I mean, for the past century, uh, this lie of Marxism has been, century and a half, has been one of the great lies of the enemy that somehow it isn't man's nature that's fallen, but somehow it is private property and the class struggle and all of that that has caused all of our problems, war and crime and so forth. And therefore, we can somehow, if we get a new system, a new economic system, abolish private property, etc., etc., somehow we can set ourselves free and become who we were meant to be and so forth and so on. It's a great lie, and that great lie has... See, listen, lie has consequence. Lie has great consequence. Error and lie will bring you into bondage and will bring you into destruction and will bring you into death. That's what Satan wants. He is the great liar. He's the father of lies. He does not, if he speaks the truth, it's to, it's to put a hook in you so that you'll believe the next thing that is a great lie. Because he's a deceiver and deceivers will, will sometimes speak the truth in order to get hook you into a great lie. And 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 what what if you have if you have ninety percent truth and ten percent error, if you have one percent error, that will lead you into death and destruction and separation from God. You need one hundred percent truth and you are only going to get it as the Holy Spirit brings the truth of the Father and the truth of the Son, which is eternal, it has no beginning, it has no end. And when the Holy Spirit brings it down, then you will come to know the truth, and the truth will set you free and will set other people free. Now, here is a great heavenly truth. It, this is one of the great, one of the greatest heavenly truths. There are many, but the, the Holy Spirit drew me, and 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 you know I. I pray over these things, I, I, I prepare, and then I pray, and then I prepare again, and then I pray, and then usually on, on Saturday morning, uh, like today, I, 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 ch I changed. The Holy Spirit said, no, don't use this, use this. And so, uh, I, I'm, in fact, I'm going to go over a passage which I've gone over many times, even in this fellowship. But the Lord has opened up so that I can see now, verse by verse, with greater clarity, because the Holy Spirit is speaking truth to me. And there is a never-ending truth. You can never, you can never come to the end of His truth. Because His mind is infinite and ours is finite. We come to the end of our own uh, uh, ability to receive truth. But, uh, 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 well, if we, if we would keep allowing the Holy Spirit to come, we wouldn't. But, uh, because the Holy Spirit would just keep bringing truth, 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 truth. But he expects to act on it. If we don't act on it, he's not going to bring us more truth. See, truth, truth again, is not, is not conceived in your mind. Men do not conceive what is true in their minds. They receive it. It's a gift. It's a gift from God. All right, let's look at John 14, verse 1. John 14, verse 1. This is a great heavenly truth. Let your, not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. You see, the, the world's heart is, our, our, our hearts are troubled. Our hearts are in turmoil. Even many Christians. And we need to believe God's truth. Believe God's truth. Believe God's truth. Believe in Jesus. Believe in Jesus. Believe in Jesus. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. So a great heavenly truth is that, the, that Jesus has gone to the right hand of the Father and he's there preparing a place for you and I. This is a very temporary place that we are in on this earth. It's a very temporary place. This is a great truth. This is just you're passing through. You're passing through. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. Ah, ah. One of the most important truths of the Bible, and the spirit of Antichrist and Satan has done everything possible, even in Christian theology, to create amillennialism and postmillennialism and all this 
theological junk, excuse me, but all these things, Jesus is coming. And he is coming again on the earth. All history is drawing down. This is a great heavenly truth. He's preparing a place for you, but before you go into that place, unless you die before, but I believe really if you die before he comes back, I don't believe the fullness of the heavenly. I don't know exactly where it is. I, there are places in heaven, there are places in, 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 in heaven that, that I think there are places where, where we are in a kind of holding tank. I don't know, I don't know how to, I don't know how to, I don't understand it. But, but I believe that the, the fullness of, of the heavenly home is not fully going to be prepared, uh, 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 or we're going to get into it until the, our bodies are raised to be with our spirit and our soul. See, when we die physically, we, our, our spirit, our soul will go uh, to be immediately into a place uh, of heavenly abode, but I don't think it's the final place. And I think it's when the, the bodies are raised, but they are only raised, all are raised only after Jesus comes back on the earth to establish his heavenly kingdom. So I go to prepare a place for you, and I will come again. I will come again. He's coming. This is one of the greatest truths of the Scripture. He is coming again. You're going to see Him. Every eye will see Him. This is not television. Every eye will see Him. He will split the eastern skies. He will march through the eastern gates of Jerusalem. The gates, those gates that are closed will be opened. And the full kingdom of God will be established. And then receive you to Myself. That where I am, you may be also. And you know the way that I'm going. Uh, Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going. How do we know the way? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth. And the Holy Spirit brings the truth of Jesus into us. And the life. You see, you can't separate truth and life. There is no life where there is not truth. There is no truth where there is not the life of God. And the Holy Spirit is the life of God. Jesus is the life, but the Holy Spirit brings the life to us. And the light. And the light is the truth. And so there is total unity between the light and the life and the truth. See, there was light before the sun and the moon were created. And when the sun is darkened, there will be a light in the heavenly kingdom, but it won't be the sun. It will be the light of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, which is expressive also. The light, I see, I see the truth. No one comes to the Father but through me. Ah, this is an offense to the world. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus, who is the truth and the Holy Spirit, who brings the truth and the life into us. An offense. An offense. But it's true! And we are going to be challenged more than ever before, young people, and all of you, not all of you young. <laughs> we are going to be challenged more than ever before. Because lie and deception and error and a spirit of error and a spirit of the world are growing and growing and growing. And they will grow. But we must speak the truth. Even when we are persecuted, because we will be persecuted when we speak the truth from the Holy Spirit. We will be persecuted because the world, much of the world is controlled by lie and error. Even inside the church, lie and error grow and grow and grow. But not in the true body of Christ, which is the spiritual body where the Holy Spirit dwells. The ecclesia the Greek word for the church is really a congregation of people 
where the life of the Holy Spirit, the truth of the Holy Spirit, dwells and flows. And because you call this building here a church, or this denomination a church, does not make it an ecclesia. Ecclesia is where the power of God, where the life of God, where the light of God, where the truth of God, through the Holy Spirit, dwells and lives in the people, individually and collectively. And that's the kind of church that God is bringing to pass once more. It existed in the early days after Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2. And in the book of Acts, it's the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Acts, really, the book of Acts is the Acts of the Holy Spirit. And there it did exist. So this is the great heavenly truth. Now, there is great truth for you and I on the earth. And I don't, when I, when I speak this next couple of things, I don't know how many people really, deep down here, really believe this truth. But I'm going to speak the truth that the Holy Spirit speaks and that Jesus speaks and the Holy Spirit brings us what Jesus speaks. Because see, the Holy Spirit wrote this word. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John and, and Moses and I mean the Holy Spirit spoke to them. If you don't understand that, you don't understand what the Bible is. If you think it's just an idea that people heard stories and, and they're recorded, you don't understand. See, a lot of the church does not understand what the Word of God is. I didn't for a long time. I didn't understand what the Word is by, by growing up in the Methodist church. And I'm not trying to knock the Methodist church any more than any other church. This would be true of most denominational churches. You don't learn much of the truth of the Holy Spirit in the average denominational church. Now look at verse 11 of this same chapter. How many people really believe this? Do you really believe this? Do you really believe this? Now Jesus is speaking, and he is the truth, and he's speaking the truth, but this is for you now, here, you and I, on the earth. He's speaking to his people. He's speaking to you and I. See, the Bible, until I realized that what Jesus spoke to the disciples, he was speaking to me as a disciple, I did not understand the Scriptures. And unless you understand that what he's speaking to the disciples, he's speaking to you, you're a disciple. And the Word is eternal. How dare we dispensationalize the Scripture? How dare we to say at this time, the scripture, this scripture was, was appropriate for the disciples, but today it isn't. Where do you find that? There is no place in the scripture. This is a lie out of the pit of hell. Everything that he spoke is eternal truth. And if he spoke it here, he's speaking it to you. And you need to take it this way. You need to understand it this way. Believe me, verse 11. I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe me on account of the works themselves. In other words, Jesus is saying, I believe the truth that is in me. I am in the Father. The Father is in me. I came to die and to, to be raised from the grave. And I came to bring you life. And, 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 and at least understand that, listen, the truth and the life and the light, they all go together, that will produce the works of God from heaven down on the earth. So he says, believe me because of the works that you see. Because these are heavenly works. These are heavenly works. See, I can say, well, I believe this is true. I have this from the Holy Spirit. And you can say, well, I don't think so. I have this from the Holy Spirit. And what I have, but wait a minute. Wait a minute. The devil will get people all twisted up. I'll tell you what, what is true. Well, let me give you an illustration. 
divine healing is true when I believe the word, get it in my heart, confess it, and the truth of that heals me, and you see me healed miraculously by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And you see someone delivered. And the works of God, truth produces the works of God. That's what he's saying. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, if you believe, you see, you believe the truth of what he says, then you will act on it. You don't believe the truth if you just give mental assent to it. You believe it when the Holy Spirit makes it alive within you. And when the Holy Spirit makes it alive within you, and as we said on the, on the faith message last week, that means that it, it is conceived, the truth of the word, the promise is conceived and life is produced in you. Before you see it happen, life is produced in you. And the works that I do, he shall do also, and greater works than he shall he do, because I go to my Father. How many Christians do you think believe that? Tell me, how many Christians, uh, uh, do all of you believe this? The Holy Spirit can make it alive. Now, you know, you could sit there and say, well, yes, I believe this. And you really want to believe this. But only if the Holy Spirit makes it alive to you and makes it truth in you, do you know that what he says is true? That you will do his works and greater. We haven't seen the greater. But the anointing, I mean, if you just take the first part, that's, that's great enough. We'll do Jesus' works. Listen, most of the church doesn't, most people in the church don't believe that. And you will not believe it. No one will believe it. Unless the Holy Spirit makes you, you to know that you know that you know. He can, he will too, if you will follow him. And how many believe, and whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. By the way, when you ask in his name, Yeshua means Yahweh is salvation, you will ask what the scripture says about the will of God. You won't be asking your will. God's not Santa Claus. Please do this. Please do that. No. You will pray what the will of God is made alive by the Holy Spirit of God so that you will know. You, will, you do not know. I mean, you can read a promise in the Word, but unless the Holy Spirit makes it so that you know that it's true, eternally true, until you know it, you're not going to act on it. I like to use the illustration of, of a tightrope across Niagara Falls. We went up to Niagara Falls this last summer with some of our family. And, uh, uh, you know, you could say, let's say you practice on a, a tightrope uh, 10 feet above the ground and you get pretty good at it. And you say, well, I believe I could walk across Niagara Falls uh, on a tightrope. Uh, but until you get up above the falls, on the tightrope above the falls, and you're walking, you don't believe it. <laughs> I mean, you you... You will, you will know only from the Holy Spirit of God. It is only the Holy Spirit that can make alive because it makes it alive to you in your spirit man. I'll say more about the spirit man later in this message. Because the spirit man is the key to where you're going to have to receive this truth. Your mind is not the key. Your mind will register. Your mind will help. And you don't throw your mind out but only your mind in cooperation with your spirit man, which we're going to talk about, and how the Holy Spirit is related to your spirit man. Because the Holy Spirit is directly related to your spirit man. I'm going to do some teaching tonight on this that, that um, you know, I've been here 36 years at, at Asbury, never heard any teaching on it. Never heard any teaching on it. And I don't hear it in the church. But God is, try, is, is, is revealing these things to people around the world, but not much here. A few here. But God wants you to, he wants you to listen. 
Verse 16, I will ask the Father and He will give you a helper, a comforter, a parakletos, one who is called alongside to help you. That is the Spirit of truth. The Holy Spirit. That is the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. I'll say more about that in a minute. The world, this cosmos, this system, this order of things, Satan is a ruler of it, they cannot receive, they cannot receive the Spirit of God. You have to repent. You have to be cut off from the world and, and then you have to believe Jesus, receive it and receive the Word and know that when the Holy Spirit, I mean, when you get born again, you ought to know in your spirit that this is true. Your experience is not what is true. Well, your mind is, what you think in your mind is not what is true. It is, it is Jesus who is the truth and the Holy Spirit is the truth and the Holy Spirit wrote this Word through the, the authors of it and the Spirit of truth will make it alive to you so that you know that you know that you know. And the world can't receive Him because they do not behold Him or know Him, but you know Him because He abides in you. Now, there's another key. Abiding. 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 We don't know much about abiding. Remaining, continuing, remaining, continuing, waiting, praying, contemplating. Everything is, is activity. Go do this, go do that. We're distracted, distracted, distracted. And God wants us to learn how to abide. And so, if we're going to understand this earthly truth, that we can do His works and greater, we're going to have to learn how to abide. And that's a great truth. And that's a great truth. Now, um, I, I, I mentioned this once before, but I'm going to put it together in a different way. Because this afternoon or this morning, I guess it was early this afternoon. Uh, uh, the Lord said, I want you to put it together this way. And then I realized, oh, yes, that's right. <laughs> well, what he, what he shows you is right. I mean, what the Holy Spirit. And, and, and so, I, I, if you look at 1 John, now John 15, let's look, look at John 15, verse 4. John 15, verse 4. Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. Now, there, there is no way that we are going to do his works and receive the truth that we can do his works and greater on the earth. This is what he wants us to do. I mean, I don't know the specific place he's called you to go, but he's, he's called you to do his works. You don't have to ask God whether he's called you to do his works. I mean, the scripture says that his disciples are called to do his works. They're not called to do your works. So he can pat you on the back and you've worked hard, son. I'm, I'm going to reward you a lot. You've really worked hard. No. The work of the Christian is to obey the word of God, to believe the word of God, to act on the word of God. To receive it as truth. Now, I'm going to have to abide in Him first. I'm going to have to learn to abide in Him. Well, you can't abide in Him until you are saved. In other words, first you've got to, you've got to receive Jesus and, and be born again. Then you need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Because you can't, see, abide means remain, 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 remain. You never, you constantly are in Him, in Him, in Him, day by day. You're in Him. Well, after you come into the Spirit, you've got to learn how to walk daily in the Spirit. Constantly walking, abiding, remaining in the Spirit. Led by the Spirit of God. Now, if you, if you, this list I got from 1 John, I, from different verses, so I won't try to, to reference it, but it's all in 1 John. If you're going to abide in Him, you'll walk as He walked. And he walked taking a cross, emptying himself, making himself of no reputation. You're going to have to stop sinning. You're going to have to stop sinning. If you do sin, you must immediately repent and turn and ask forgiveness. You're going to have to love others more than yourself. You're going to have to love others more than yourself, in deed and in truth, not just with your mouth. 
You're going to have to serve others. You're going to have to lay your life down for others. That's what Jesus did. If you don't, you won't be abiding in Him. You're going to have to have compassion. Being suffering along with. Did you ever notice how many times the disciples or Jesus had compassion on someone? They were praying for someone. I remember Jesus had compassion on, on, on the, the man with a paralyzed hand and was healed. And all the Pharisees, the religious leaders, could think about is he did it on the Sabbath. And, and Jesus was furious with them. He was angry with them. Here's a man who was totally healed. He had compassion on them. And all they could worry about is their religious rules. Jesus hates this. More than he hates paganism. For people to pretend righteousness by rules that ignore the need of people who need to be touched. And Jesus wants to touch them. He must keep his commandments. He must keep his commandments. That means you must act on them. If you abide in Him, you will not fear anything that man does. Only God. You will not fear man. You will not fear the world. You will not fear anything but God. Because if you do, your love is not perfected. But what the Lord showed me, I can't do any of those things unless I have received the Holy Spirit and full of the Holy Spirit and walking day by day in the Spirit of God. I can't do any of those things. Only, only if I have been saved, the Holy Spirit comes and brings me life, and I have been baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit of God, and He just keeps flowing, overflowing, overflowing, overflowing. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, gentleness, meekness, faithfulness, self-control. Just flowing, flowing. Then I can walk as he walked. Then I can stop sinning. Then I can love others. Then I can have compassion. Then I can keep his commandments. Then I won't fear. I mean, without the Holy Spirit, you you can't do any of this. And so there is no possibility of abiding and remaining day by day except as the Holy Spirit brings the truth of the Word and you act on it. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, he bears much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Get that into your hearts. Apart from him, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit who brings Jesus and his life and his truth, you can do nothing. You can do nothing. Most Christians don't know this. If anyone does not abide in me, He is thrown away as a branch and dries up and they gather them and they cast them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my word abides in you, word brings life, his word is the truth and and, and you, you will not let it go. When you are abiding in him and the word is in you, you will not let it go. No matter how much Satan attacks you, no matter how much the world attacks you, no matter how much suffering, no matter how much persecution. I mean, the devil is trying to get the word out of you. He's trying to keep the word from coming into you. The truth, the truth of God. Because the truth of God will set people free. And the truth of God will defeat all of Satan's lies. Now, John 16. I'm going to skip one place here, because I want to be sure to get to one passage before we're through tonight. Uh, John 16. And verse 7. John 16 and verse 7. I tell you the truth. Okay, listen. Jesus is telling you the truth. I tell you the truth. 
it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I don't go away, the Helper, the Holy Spirit, the Helper Parakletos, will not come to you. And if I go, I will send him to you. You can't, you can't receive the truth, remain in the truth, until the Holy Spirit is sent. And the Holy Spirit was sent in a special way, because although you receive the Holy Spirit when you're born again, the Holy Spirit is not in you in fullness so that you can abide and remain and, and continue to flow. And you can't do the works of God. You can't, you, you can't heal the sick and cleanse the lepers and raise the dead and cast out demons. You can't, you can't do the work that Jesus did unless the Holy Spirit comes to baptize you and fill you to overflowing. And he said he would do that when he went to the right hand of the Father. And, that, and, and that's when Pentecost came. He went to the right hand of the Father. And on the 50th day after the resurrection from the grave, and then he was 40 days on the earth. Then he was up to the right hand of the Father. Then he sent the Holy Spirit down on the earth. And then anyone who would receive, three of you are here tonight, were baptized, filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Some others of you have been, uh, we prayed for, and you've been baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit of God here. And, and, and so uh, you, you are in good company. You were in a good place. Uh, now, now, listen to what he tells them. And he, this is the Holy Spirit, when he comes, will convict the world. Now, condemn, no, no, not condemn, convict, convict. Conviction is the work of the Holy Spirit to get people to repent. Whenever you're under condemnation, that's Satan. Whenever you're under condemnation, that's Satan. God and, and Jesus and the Holy Spirit don't condemn. They convict. Their judgment is not condemnation. Their judgment is out of love, and it's temporary judgment to get people to repent, and only finally when they will not repent will they be sent to judgment in hell. So, here's what he says. There are three things. There are three things. And when he comes, he will convict the world. This is, this is people in the world who are who are influenced by the world system and the world's values. We all are until we are saved and filled with the Spirit. And until we allow the Holy Spirit, and we've got to walk in the Spirit to be cut off from the standards of the world. Concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. All right, it's three things. Sin, righteousness, judgment. Concerning sin. All right. So, the Holy Spirit will convict you about the truth of sin. And the truth of, about sin that the Holy Spirit will convict you of is that you are only sinless when you believe God and act on what the Holy Spirit brings to you. You come to Christ. You believe that Jesus died for you, that he was raised for you. When you're filled with the Spirit, you believe that he went to the right hand, that he's baptizing you in the Holy Spirit. Believing, believing, the only true sin is unbelief. The only true sin is unbelief. And the Holy Spirit will convict you of unbelief. And then you can repent and believe and believe. And only when you believe, when you accept the truth of God's will and act on it, only then are you sinless. And so the Holy Spirit will convict you of sin, and he will convict you and show you that you must believe. Your whole work, your whole work on the earth is believing and acting. Your whole work on the earth is believing and acting. And then he will convict you of true righteousness. See, once you believe it, and once the Holy Spirit puts it in your heart, you act on it by confessing it. Uh, uh, Abram confessed uh, after God promised to you, given his descendants to the sand of the sea and the stars of the sky. Uh, Abram confessed, wavered a little bit there about Isaac, uh, but uh, finally came to where God you know, caused him to repent and of, of Hagar and, and, and all of that. Uh, uh, but he came to believe and, and, and see righteousness. The Holy Spirit convicts you of righteousness 
and you are righteous only after believing when you act by confessing the Word of God and see this is what God loves when you act on what the Holy Spirit says. You don't see anything yet, but you believe it. Then you act on it and you become righteous. You become righteous before what, you have pro what He has promised has, has been done yet. See, Abram was righteous when he believed God, not after Isaac was born, and certainly not after all the descendants of the sand of the sea and the stars of the skies, because they're still happening for Abram. <laughs> He's in heaven a long time, but they're still happening. They're still descendants. So righteousness, the Holy Spirit convicts of righteousness because he convicts us so that we will not first will believe the truth, so we'll get out of sin, then we'll act on the truth that we have received and confess it, even though we haven't yet seen it. And see, when we receive that, that's what faith is. Then, concerning judgment, because I go to the Father, or excuse me, I go to uh, judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. In other words, the Holy Spirit will convict me of judgment. There is a judgment coming, and the Holy Spirit will show you if you'll receive it. And why do you need, after you have believed and then acted, and that makes you righteous, you have believed, and that's getting out of sin when you believe, and then when you act on it, it's righteousness. But then what he wants you to do is separate yourselves, let the Holy Spirit convict you so that the Holy Spirit truth will come and you will separate yourselves from the world. You will allow the Holy Spirit really to separate yourselves from the world and the standards of the world. Why? Because it's already judged. And you can't act as a believer in faith and righteousness if you're still attached. It's going to drag you down if you're still attached to the world because the world's already under judgment. Because Satan has already been judged. And he's the ruler of this world. And so the Holy Spirit will convict you of all these things so that you can believe first, then you can receive an act, and then you can cut yourself off from the world because, listen, even after you have believed and acted, if you keep attached to the world, I know, I, I, I mean, uh, you know, you can come to the place where, let's say you're believing for healing and, and, and the Holy Spirit shows you uh, that the Word does say you are healed, okay? I believe that, all right? I believe it, all right? Now, uh, then I, I began to confess it because I realized that the Holy Spirit has made this alive and it's true, and I began to confess it. I act on it. Now, sometimes you don't receive a miracle of healing. Sometimes it's gradual. And so the enemy will come with a lot of things in the world, especially in the case of physical healing, this symptom, that symptom. See, because physical symptoms are part of the world. They're not a part of the heavenly kingdom. And so then he'll try to convince you that this is what's real. Uh-oh, got it again. This is what's real, see. So you've got you to gotta allow the Holy Spirit to cut you, cut you off from the, from the world and what, how the world thinks. See, to, to receive healing from cancer, I had, I had to let God cut me off from the way the world thinks. And, and, and you, you may be ridiculed, but I mean, you've got, you got to uh, allow God to cut you off from all of these things, and the Holy Spirit will do that. Uh, by the way, I, I, I don't have time to read it because I want to get to a scripture passage here before we're through tonight. I don't want to go real long. But... Uh, uh, in 1 John 2 and 1 John 4, uh, I, I won't, I won't uh, take you to the Scripture. Well, I will take you to the one, 1 John 4, 3. And then I'll go to my last Scripture, 1 John 4, 3. Now, once you have believed and you act and you are in righteousness and you allow the Holy Spirit to cut, your, cut you off, You've got to understand that the world, there's a different principle in the world. And this is one of the reasons why he wants to cut you off from the world, because 
This is what John says in 1 John 4, verse 3. Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God and is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard is coming as now already in the world. All right. The Antichrist spirit is a lying spirit. In fact, the spirit of Antichrist and the spirit of error and lying are twins. First time I ever used that phrase, and I was praying today, and, and the Holy Spirit says, these spirits are twins. Because the, the Antichrist spirit uh, is against who Jesus is, and Jesus is the truth. And it's anti everything Jesus is and will do. And so, if it's anti everything Jesus is and he's the truth and the Holy Spirit brings that truth, then the Antichrist spirit is a lying spirit. And the spirit of error and lying are, is a twin spirit with, with the Antichrist spirit. Just so truth is a twin of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. So, whatever is taught that is against Christ and who Christ is, is Antichrist spirit, and it's in the world. And then he says, you are from God, little children, and have overcome them. We will overcome. The truth will overcome a lie. Now listen, you will never overcome Satan, demonic spirits, anything Satan does, until you are totally in the truth. The Holy Spirit has brought that truth in you. You believe it, you act on it, and you cut yourself off from the world, and, and, and because the world and its values is an antichrist spirit and a lying spirit and a spirit of error. You wonder why people believe the things they do? It's because they're controlled by a spirit of error. Don't be surprised at the fiery trial, Peter says, that will come upon you, because when you believe the truth and most of the world believes uh, what is false, they're going to persecute you. But they, when persecuting you, will believe that they are actually believing the truth, when they are believing actually a lie. Because the spirit of error, by definition, is such a strong spirit that persons absolutely believe that they are believing the truth when they are believing a lie. And they think that Christians who are speaking the truth are speaking lies. We're from God. He also knows God listens to us. He who does not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. The spirit of error is growing and growing and growing. In our history seminar, I lecture to the students, my two lectures, my senior seminar for history students, on the lies that are told by professional historians about the history of the Cold War. You could have many other examples, but I know more about that history than I probably any history in modern history. And so, but, but I mean, most of what's taught is absolutely lie. It's totally lie. I'm not talking about just distortion. I'm not just talking about a, 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 a misinterpretation. I'm talking about deliberate falsehood. The United States caused the Cold War. The United States is the main dis de destroyer in the world today. A lot of people believe this. In this country, a lot of people believe this. And see, this is, this is a, 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 a expression of the spirit of truth and spirit of error. And so if, if, if we speak the truth and people listen to us, then the Holy Spirit is leading them. Because, and, 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 and ultimately, you want to go to people who will listen. Of course, if they're pagans, maybe they'll listen to the truth that they need to repent. A pagan can only receive the truth in regard to he needs to repent. And when he repents and receives Christ, then he has an ability to begin to hear the truth. So... Here's where I want to close. The Holy Spirit is truth. And he wants us to understand that he speaks the truth. And I have used this passage, and I'm going to close with this passage. 
a number of times, many times. God has drawn me to this passage over and over. But I've seen something new in it. Because, and I, I probably will expand on this because next time I didn't get to say too much about how the Holy Spirit wants to speak to you. Because the Holy Spirit, I, I, I look at all of you, the Holy Spirit wants to speak to you directly. He wants to speak the truth to you directly. He wants you to hear what he's speaking. It'll be later that I teach on the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit of God. I'll go one by one later on the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, again, I've been in one more 36 years. I, I have not heard an, an, what I would regard an accurate biblical teaching yet on, on the, the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, because unless you are acting in them and on them and moving in them, you can't really teach. You can't. God told me a long time ago, son, do not teach something you have not received and acted on. Don't try to teach what you've read someone in a book. Don't try to teach something that you have not experienced, that you have not acted on. Now, I close with these four verses. 1 Corinthians 2, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, guess 5. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 10. Now, for to us, God, now the Greek word doesn't mean this, but the Hebrew word for God is Elohim, and the Hebrew word for God means God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. For to us, God revealed them, and the Holy Spirit brings what the Father and Jesus want us to know. For to us, God revealed them through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. Now, only the Holy Spirit, listen to me now, only the Holy Spirit can understand, can search and understand and reveal the depths of God's truth. This word doesn't reveal all of God's truth. Even when we move in the Spirit, we don't understand all of God's truth. His truth, His mind is infinite, and we are finite, but the Holy Spirit is infinite too. And so the Holy Spirit, and only the Holy Spirit, there is no way to under... I started this by saying, truth can only be eternal. Truth can only be eternal. It has no beginning. It has no end. It is absolute. But it is so broad and so vast and so deep. Do you think you understand about the truth about the universes? I mean, we don't even, we, we, don't, we can't even come close. The Holy Spirit is the only one that can come to us and reveal truth. Okay? So you must be saved, filled with the Spirit, moving in the Spirit to receive much truth from God. That's the first thing. Now, second, verse 11. Who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of a man which is in him? Even so the thoughts of God no one knows except the spirit of God. Now, here's what the Holy Spirit revealed, and I've never put it this way because I've never quite understood it this way. I've, I've searched and searched year after year after year teaching on this, trying to, asking God, what do you mean, Lord? What do you mean? What do you mean? Here's what the, the Holy Spirit said today. The spirit of man can only receive from the spirit of God. Now, the spirit of man is our vertical window. It is our intuitive capacity. The Bible speaks of it as the heart. And so we have a spirit. God breathed his Holy Spirit, and man 
became a living soul, but only after the Holy Spirit hit the dust. We have a spirit. It isn't our mind. Listen now. It is, listen now. It isn't our mind, our intellect, that can directly receive from the Holy Spirit of God. It is only our spirit. Spirit to spirit. Are, are, are you listening? Holy Spirit to our spirit. The essence of who you are is your spirit. And any effort to use our intellect separate from our spirit and the Holy Spirit speaking to our spirit will cause us to conceive error. The mind separated the intellect. I don't care what your intellect, what your IQ is. In fact, people with a real high IQ have ten tendency to divinize their mind to make uh, their mind God more than the person who has a little, just a little intellect, a small IQ. The higher your IQ, the more likely you are to think, mm, I'm pretty smart. And I can conceive what God is like, and I can, I can come to truth. No, when you separate your intellect and your mind from the Holy Spirit speaking to your spirit, now you don't have to, but when you do, you could conceive error. You're going to conceive error. This is why there's so much bondage, violence, destruction, death in the world. We are fallen in, in every way. And we are fallen in our intellect. And so, and the only way we can renew our mind is to read the Word, 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 act on the Word, act on the Word, act on the Word. But as we read the Word and act on the Word, it's the Holy Spirit that makes it alive to our spirit. See, that's why, let me read that verse again. For who among men knows the thoughts, the depths, the depths of a man? Except the spirit, the spirit, the spirit of the man. Even so, the thoughts of God, the depths of God, no one knows except the spirit of God. The spirit of God knows the depths of God, the truth of God. And the spirit of God can reveal that to my spirit man when I, be, when I begin to obey it. Now notice, not now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit is of God. The spirit of the world is the spirit of wisdom and knowledge of the world. And, and when we receive that, that's where the Antichrist spirit is. That's where the lying spirit is. The Antichrist spirit, anti who Jesus is. You listen to the, the greatest intellects today that are in the Western, well, all over the world, and the greatest intellects in the world today. Speak against Jesus. Speak against the Word. Speak against who Jesus is. Mock the, that He is coming again. Mock what the, the, the Scripture says about who He is and what He is going to do and how He is going to establish His kingdom. So we cannot receive, we've got to be cut off, not only from the standards and values of the world, but from the spirit of the world. Because the spirit of the world is the spirit of error and the spirit of Antichrist. And when we separate our mind and our intellect from our spirit, led by the Holy Spirit, we too, even if we call ourselves Christian, all kinds of people call themselves Christians. You can call yourself a Christian, and you can, with your mind, say that you have, 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 have uh, received Christ, but unless he has, the Holy Spirit has come to cause you to be born again, you are not born again. Unless the Holy Spirit has come to baptize you in the Spirit, you will not be abiding in the Spirit and abiding in his truth. You won't be believing it, acting on it, where people are set free. I mean, he is real, people. He is real. Jesus is real. The Holy Spirit is real. And he, and he wants to come into you and he wants to bring the truth so that the works of God from heaven will be done and people will be saved and healed and delivered and set free. And he wants you to do that. But he knows that you need to, 
You need to understand this principle. It sounds complicated, but don't, don't let it be complicated. Listen now, verse 12. We receive not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God. Why? Why do we need the Holy Spirit of God? Why do we need the Spirit of God? He will bring the truth about what? The things that God has freely given to us. I mean, and if we'd read earlier in the passage, I mean God through Jesus has come to save us, to heal us, to deliver us, to deliver us from every bondage. Everything that you're in tonight that you need to be set free from, He came not to just get you into heaven, but He came to set you free down here on the earth so that you can be full of love, joy, peace, patience, goodness. I mean, so that all of the truth of God can come in you and it can flow through you and can you touch other people and other people can be set free and you can be used by God. How could it be that we little weak things could be used by an eternal God who is full of truth and love and power and faith and yet we can be used when we receive this truth, when we act on this truth from the Holy Spirit of God. And so it's like this. The Holy Spirit speaks to my spirit. And by the way, this is the only way you understand the word. I've used this before, but I'll use it again. You, do, you cannot understand the word with your mind because you'll only have an intellectual conception of it. The, the, the Greek word means to combine a spiritual knowledge with an intellectual knowledge. And a spiritual knowledge means that the Holy Spirit speaks to your spirit and says, Oh, it's true. It's true. Before you see it, it's true. I remember the first time ever sitting on a desk in the administration building in Dr. Gallman's office. We were praying for students to be healed. That's the first time I'd ever prayed for students to be healed. And I read Matthew 8, and it said, When the evening was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed of demons, and he cast out the spirits with his word, and he healed all that were sick, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, He himself took our infirmities and removed our sicknesses. And God said, We were praying for someone. Uh, uh, let's say it's <laughs> Chris. And the Lord said, He's healed. He's healed. Oh, praise God. Hallelujah. And he was. And he was. Because... The Holy Spirit spoke to my spirit. And I understood it. Here. The Holy Spirit speaking to my spirit. And I understood it here. And then I confessed it. Faith is never generated by your mind. Your mind will, fa in fact, argue with your spirit. When the Holy Spirit speaks to your spirit, your mind will say, oh, no, that can't be. That can't be. I, I, it almost always still happens when I'm praying deliverance deep from demons. Because that's so much totally in the realm of the Spirit. Unless you're hearing from the Holy Spirit, you're not going to be having any success at all. And, 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 and so many times when you're praying with, 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 with the release of demons, it just seems so silly to your mind. And your mind always argues with what the Spirit is saying to your spirit. He just says, he just says, obey. Line up your mind with the Holy Spirit in your spirit. Tell your mind to line up. <laughs> then, and what are you freely given? I mean, we don't understand what he's freely given. Then so the, these things which we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. Spiritual thoughts. See, the, the tongue. Oh. <laughs> now let me close. The tongue. The tongue can speak from the mind. And we, we learn to use our tongue usually to speak the things that our mind is thinking. And, and sometimes we give pe people a piece of our mind and we ought never to do so. <laughs> We need to give them a piece of our spirit <laughs> in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> but, the, but, the, but the tongue can also speak the things that the Holy Spirit speaks to our spirit. Now, lots of times when, when it's spoken to our spirit, if the mind is under, is under the Word of God, it'll be registered in our mind. But if it's registered in our mind, from the Holy Spirit, it goes Holy Spirit, Spirit, Mind. 
you see what this is saying? Holy Spirit, spirit. Holy Spirit, my spirit, mind. Took me a long time to realize that this could be from God. Because I thought, well, this might be just what I think. But if you're in the Word, in the Word, in prayer, in prayer, if you're filled with the Spirit, if you're walking in the Spirit, you can begin to assume. If you if you stay in the Word, stay in prayer, you can begin to assume that what God just keeps speaking, keeps speaking. Because what's in your spirit is going to keep coming back to your mind, back to your mind. It's not going to be a fleeting thought. And then you give expression. Paga! is released because you're speaking what the Holy Spirit is speaking and he's speaking truth the truth is registered in your spirit the only way you know what truth is is as the Holy Spirit registers it in your spirit then how do you test it you speak it and the first time I began speaking truth from the Holy Spirit I thought oh, my goodness it was the Holy Spirit <laughs> you know people God was good because God would, would uh, you'd pray for someone and, and people would say, well, how did you know that? Well, yeah, that, uh, yeah, that, that was right. Yeah, I, I, I. And now, of course, we, and this is what God wants for you. He wants you to hear the truth from the Holy Spirit of God. Let the Holy Spirit speak to your spirit. Let it dominate your mind and begin to use your tongue to speak. That's one of the reasons why he wants you to speak in tongues. Because when you're speaking in tongues, when you're praying, this is prayer language, not, not public gift, but prayer language. When you're praying in tongues, your mind is unfruitful. And you're beginning to learn how to use your tongue, relying on the Spirit of God only, only on the Spirit of God. I think that's the only, only real importance to me. Because, uh, you know, uh, Interpretation of tongues to a public meeting, I've never, I've been in meetings where that's happened, but I, uh, I've never seen too much fruit out of, out of that, except when you're first new and you want to, you want to see something supernatural, <laughs> which is kind of, which is really the wrong motivation. But when, when you're praying in the Spirit, you, you're learning how uh, to speak, and, and, and then your mind can't be involved. So he's trying to teach you how to use your tongue, relying on the Spirit of God, so that you can speak the truth. 